I can hear myself really well. I hope you can all hear me too. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? Okay. So I am talking about peace today. And, but first of all, I'd like to pray. So um, let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you because you are great and glorious and marvelous. And Father God, we, we really don't have the words to describe you. But today, Lord God, we want to learn more about living as children of your kingdom. And Father God, we thank you that we can learn from you daily, all the time. That you never leave us without the wisdom. That wisdom is there for us, Lord God. And Father, even as we hear these words today, Lord God, let our hearts be turned towards you to receive them and to act upon them. Amen. Okay, so peace. Ever since creation, man has looked for peace. Unfortunately, man tends, man's look for peace tends to be mostly unsuccessful. I mean, last century was a really good example. In the beginning of the century, we saw the rise of communism. The theory that if everyone lived and shared resources equally, that there would be harmony and unity. Did that happen? No. Then we had the war to end all wars. Was it the last war we've ever had? No. No. In 1938, the British Prime Minister came back to England and he announced, my good friends, for the second time in our history, a British Prime Minister has returned from Germany bringing priests and honor. I believe it is peace for our time. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Go home and get a nice, quiet sleep. Peace. The, the next year we were at war. Again, with Germany. Did that peace work? You know, man's diplomacy did not work. Later on, in the 1960s and 70s, the Beatles asked us to give peace a chance. Actually, it was John Lennon. And they saw the solution as being a great big melting pot where we'd all become the same as each other. And then John Lennon imagined imagined a world where we could all live as one. And a whole generation imbibed his philosophy of ridding the world of differences. And we're still reaping that today. He said there should be no race, no religion, no patriotism, no possessions, and people living for today, not with future in mind. They didn't really catch on. Although my generation is still, still has some of those ideals. Even in the Old Testament, we see people craving for that peace. And you know, there came a time where Israel was under God's punishment. That God had, had said, you will not do what I've called you to do. So I am going to have to do something with you. But the people would gravitate towards so-called prophets who would say, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. You know, two, two of those prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, came with the same message. They heard God's view. And they spoke against this peace message. You know, Jeremiah was first. And he said about them, you have healed the brokenness of my people superficially. Saying, peace, peace. But there was no peace. And then Ezekiel had the same message. And he said, God was saying, he was speaking against those prophets. And he said, they have no place 
in the council of my people. No place in my kingdom, I suppose he was saying. Because they have definitely misled my people by saying peace where there is no peace. Now, both Jeremiah and Ezekiel became outcasts for bringing this message. But God was not too impressed with man's attempt to bring peace. And I don't believe he's too impressed with what happened last century either or what is still happening this century. That man is trying to get rid of the differences so that we can live in peace and unity and harmony. You know, there is a way where God wants us to live in peace. And back in the Old Testament, there was a king. King David longed for peace. His approach was different. Now, King David was actually called a man after God's own heart. I won't read that scripture for you. I believe it's up there. Yes. So... We've got these two views of peace. God's view and our man's view. So we should probably ask ourselves, what is this peace thing? Is it just the absence of strife and war? Or is it much more than that? And then once we've sorted that out, we need to work out, well, where does this peace come from? Or how do we get this peace? How do we walk in peace? So let's have a look at the meaning. Now generally, when you look it up in dictionaries, it's generally as a state of quiet or tranquility. It's a freedom from disturbance or agitation, and it can apply to society, which is the way we usually use it in this world, or to individuals. It also means harmony, and a state of reconciliation between parties. Our Old Testament word is shalom, and it means peace, harmony, wholeness, completeness, and prosperity. So it's a sense of fulfillment. So there's much more than just that ah, feeling. In the New Testament, it's irene. That's the Greek word. And it means peace of mind. And it was often used as a greeting, which is interesting. So biblically, peace is much more than just what the Old Testament people took it as, as being freedom from our enemies. It's much more than that. God promised his people peace. This sense of well-being, this sense of fulfillment. You know... In Isaiah, which is probably up there for you, it was fulfilled about what we're best about to, you know, celebrate Christmas. And it was filled, fulfilled when that son of God came down to earth. And he was going to be the prince of peace. And he is the prince of peace. And it said something else about him. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. And then Haggai went on to say, he said, do not fear. Because there's going to come a time where there's going to be peace in this place, referring to Jerusalem. Those of you who've been around a while will know that, you know, often, often that refers to the church now in the new covenant. So even when all is shaking, God has promised us peace. He's promised us that sense of well-being and rest and tranquility in our hearts. So even when things are going drastically wrong, we can have that. You know, Jesus was born, and he came, and he started teaching people. One of the things he taught them was what we call the Beatitudes. And one of those Beatitudes 
is blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called the sons of God. He did not say, blessed are the peacekeepers. I don't know about you, but me, I grew up in a great household. I had two loving parents and an older sister. And um, it was a very secure place. But I grew up with that sense of responsibility that I had to be the one who would keep the peace in the household. I grew up not rocking the boat. If there was anything which was going on in the house, like my sister was getting grumpy for some reason, I felt responsible. I felt like it was my fault and I had to fix it. So as I grew up, I became adept at compromising. I became adept at lying to keep the peace. It was a good lying, it was keeping the peace. And I also became adept at people pleasing. I would do anything to make the people I loved in my life, my mum and dad, happy. I would say the right thing, I would do the right thing, just so that things would be peaceful at home. But I became a shell, and what was inside needed to change. I can't, couldn't live my life like that any longer. And when I first decided that I was going to surrender my life to God, it caused ructions in my house because of all of a sudden, I would say what I thought at home. And I came to my mother turning to me one time and said, you used to be nicer. You always used to keep the peace. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so it, it was a bit of a wake-up call for me that, you know, something had actually changed inside of me. That I didn't have to have that responsibility of keeping the peace anymore. But now I could be a peacemaker. And now my... My family, that family is harmonious and we, we all get on well and I, I don't have to feel responsible if things are not working out. But I can pray and I can help and um, we, we can love. And that's, that's a different thing than just people pleasing. So, he promised he was going to give us. Jesus promised. He was going to give us peace when he went. He said, peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. But not as the world gives. It's a bit of a clue, isn't it? He's not going to give us peace necessarily in our outward circumstances. But in our, our inward, that's the peace he's left us. You know, all through the Bible, um, different writers felt like, like they were inspired from God to write about peace. But I noticed as I was reading through and looking up scriptures and that kind of thing, that often they would connect peace with other different things that bring a full, much, much fuller picture. So Isaiah 9, we've already um, Verse 7, we've already looked at. There will be no end to the increase of his covenant of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on forevermore. So the first connection I found was this justice and righteousness. Righteousness. Let's remember that. And then in Jeremiah, the one who got outcast because of speaking against the prophets who were saying, peace, peace, when there was no peace. He said, behold, I bring it 
health and healing, and I will heal them. And I will reveal to them an abundance of peace and truth. Okay, that was something which I lacked. I might have been able to work out the peace bit, but the truth bit just wasn't there. So it was unbalanced. And I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel and will reveal them as they were at first. And then Psalms. This could have been written by David. I didn't actually look up and see whether it was or not. It says, The Lord will give strength to his people and the Lord will bless his people with peace. So there is a strength which comes with the peace which God gives us. There's a stability which comes with it, but there's a strength on the inside which comes with it. Happiness and salvation is the next one. That's in Isaiah 52 verse 7. Who announces peace and bring good news of happiness and who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. Salvation. Salvation. Salvation from the things, the enemies of our soul, I'd say. It's what Jesus came to do. To take the punishment for those things which we have deliberately done wrong and against him. And some of the things which we didn't deliberately do wrong. There is a salvation which comes from that. We do not have, we no longer have to pay the price because Jesus paid it for us. And then Colossians. Okay, sorry, I've just skipped a whole bit. That's okay. So, we got this piece. How do we get it? First of all, it comes through our atonement, what we call atonement. Now, that's, that's really just um, Jesus paying the price for us, I suppose you could say. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. This is what happened on the cross. The chastisement for our peace or well-being fell upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. So it wasn't just salvation he came to bring us. It was that sense of fulfillment and well-being that he came to bring us on the cross. That sense of well-being. Who would like that? Do we move in it? Let's keep going. So we have been justified by faith. The Romans tells us that. And then we have the peace of God in our hearts. Believe that God's a real peaceful. You know, we have that peace. Same peace he has. We have. But we have to take hold of it. So to walk in peace is that taking hold of the peace which he's already... You know, we are children of the kingdom. When we come and give our lives to him, when we come and say, no longer am I going to walk the way of the world, I'm going to walk God's way, we surrender. We sang about surrender this morning. We surrender ourselves to him. We have this opportunity to walk his way. We become children of his kingdom. Now, when you think of a kingdom, you think, okay, there's got to be law, there's got to be responsibilities, there's got to be duties. But let's have a read what Romans 4, 7 says the kingdom's about. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Three components of the kingdom. Righteousness, peace, and joy. That righteousness we've talked a bit about. The joy Mark talked about last week. I recommend that to you. You can look it up on um, YouTube. 
It's definitely up, isn't it? Yes, good. So, this kingdom we've become a part of. This statement was a plea for people to live in unity with one another. It was a call to be unoffended because of side issues like food, what you eat and what you don't eat. It was a call to walk in righteousness, loving what God loves and hating what God hates. And take hold of what he paid highly for, that work on the cross, to bring us into right relationship with God. It was a call to live with others, with love and compassion, but not compromise the truth. And it was a call to rejoice in those relationships we have with each other. So let's have a look at a scripture which I really like. This is in Philippians 4, verse 4 to 7. We're just going to go through this a little bit slowly. I'll read it first and then we'll start going through it. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known towards men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So the first thing we're to do is rejoice. Rejoice. Be gentle with others. So often we can be hard with others and harsh with others. I know parents often have that thing, oh gosh, I was really hard there. But we're called to be gentle. Resist anxiety. You know, anxiety, I always take anxiety as being a sign that something's not right with me. That I'm trusting perhaps in the wrong things. I'm trusting perhaps in something of the world's ways to do something wrong or to do something right even. But I'm trusting in my own strength and not in God's strength to do things. I've got numerous times where I thought, oh, look, I'll, I'll make such and such for tea and um, I, j- I, j- I, I can do this. And it's not that I, I say to God, oh, I, I don't need your help, but I'm trusting in myself to do it right. And guess what? I burn something, I spill something, I cut my finger, you know, just, just something silly happens. And I'm like, hmm, I don't think I was really relying too closely on what God would have me do for this. I might have been sort of, but not really. So when you feel that anxiety rising up, as most of us do, not all of us, most of us do, start thinking. What am I trusting in? Am I trusting in God? Am I trusting in God's word? Or have I got something else happening for me right now? Pray about it. Take everything to God in prayer. Ask God for help and wisdom. But do it humbly. Do it out of surrender. Don't say to God, God, I need your help with this. Oh, no, I don't like that way of doing it. I'll do it my own way. That's not being humble. That's actually being prideful. You know, we ask God for help because we need help. Don't be proud. God will resist you if you are proud. Be thankful. There's so much to be thankful for. And ask God specifically for the the solution that you need. And he will give you the wisdom. He has promised to give us wisdom when we need it. I want to go back to David now. 
So David, David was king. God had called him. He'd chosen him especially because the other king had not been obedient. So he called him out of a place of in obscurity into a place of kingship. Okay, but David's reign wasn't smooth sailing. He had two sons who tried to take his kingdom away from him different times. He had uh, other people rebelling against him. He had a um, leader of his army who would go off and do stuff which he thought he should do, which, which was not good. So David's, you know, David was often criticized. He was even criticized one time by his wife for worshiping God. Not good. But he said in Psalm 4, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. He knew something about God. He knew how God saw him. He knew that God loved him. He knew that God had set him apart. In verse 3 it says, But know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. And the Lord will heal here when I call to him. So he had this confidence that God had set him apart, but also that when he talked to God, God was actually going to hear him and help him. He put his trust in God. And later on in that psalm, it says, Be angry and don't sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in God. He made sure that even when he was anxious, he did not sin. And he found a way to calm himself. He did that through prayer. He did that through relying on God. The result was joy. The result was peace. You have put gladness in my heart, he said, more than the, in the season, the, the rain and the grain, the rain and the grain, the grain and the wine have increased. I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. He knew that even as king, he could not rely on himself or his guard to make him dwell in safety. Or his guard, sorry, not God. It's a slight difference. The longest book in the Bible, Psalm 199. Psalm 119, verse 99 says, I have more understanding than all my teachers. This is David again. For your testimonies are my meditation. He focused on what God had already done for him. He focused, perhaps, on the time where God was able to, to defeat Goliath through him with one stone. He focused on God keeping his promise that he would be king. He focused on the, the protection that he'd seen, the kingdom. He focused on the good things which had happened. And we can do the same thing. You hear of a good testimony? Focus on that. You hear of some, some, somebody who's been healed from what you're struggling with? Focus on that. Allow God to minister that to you, that life to you. That's what David did. And that let him lie down in peace and sleep. So we too can know God. His peace. We can know his peace. Even in the worst of our circumstances. Even when things seem to be really 
just a mess for us. Let's pray. You know, if you've never even given your life to God, this peace is not going to be much good to you. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. Because this peace comes with surrendering ourselves to God. And, and if you've never done that and would like to do that, first of all, you have to recognize that God is who he says he is. And recognize that Jesus came to take your place for everything you've done, which you shouldn't have done. And then you turn from those things. And then he brings you into his kingdom with all of that. And as I said before, it's not a matter of rules and duties, but it's the matter of righteousness, peace, and joy. So I'm going to pray now, and if, if you would like to pray with me, you'll be welcome to. Father, I recognize you. You are the great God, and the great King above all gods. And I turn my face towards you now. And I say, I recognize too who I am. That I've not lived your way. And I've never surrendered to you. And I choose today to surrender myself to you. Thank you, Jesus. And I know there's probably many believers here. Or some believers here who might have be experiencing anxiety issues. I want to pray for you too. Because I know for myself, anxiety is one thing which can really stop us from living our lives the way that God wants us to. Father, thank you so much that you have brought each one of us into your kingdom be able to worship you, to know your love. And Father God, right now we turn our faces to you. And we say that we surrender. We surrender all our ways. And we thank you that you would replace them with your ways. And bring that peace, Lord God. Even when things are shaky, we ask that you bring peace. Amen.